الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Uh, so welcome everyone to the continuing uh, series about uh, Al Andalus or Muslim Spain. Um, so I'd like to first I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I know it's Friday night and you know a long week of school. People are tired, so Jazakumullah khair for for coming, attending, and I hope you benefit uh, inshallah from today's talk. Um, do we have uh, do we have prizes for tonight? No prize. You know, I always love the prizes because then I can uh, keep people, uh, you know, in tuned in. But inshallah, even without the prizes, we'll try to keep. Uh... <laughs> okay, we can get prizes. That's good. Maybe we're we getting pizza today or no? Uh... So can we give away like some free pizza for the? Uh... Okay, so I have. We'll. Uh... If you answer questions correctly, you can get a slice of pizza. Inshallah. Uh, one slice per person maximum, so we don't bankrupt, uh, don't bankrupt Mac. Um, so basically, I just wanted to um, uh, start with a little bit of a review. Um, so we're gonna have a start. Okay. I'm gonna start with a quick review, inshallah, of what Brother Ahmed uh, covered last week. Uh, we're gonna talk about the concept in general of art and culture in Islam. Uh, because we, we came down on uh, poor Ziryab uh, hard last week, right? We uh, really blamed him for all the problems. So we wanted to say that, uh, you know, not all art and culture is bad. There's good art and culture, there's bad. And we wanted to kind of clarify, uh, you know, where does Islam stand on art and culture, inshallah. I'm not giving any fatwas about music because I, I don't want to go there, but uh, we'll just give a general uh, synopsis, inshallah. Uh, we'll talk about the... Um, Umawi uh, Khalifat, and uh, the, so we, we, we talked about the different periods in Islamic history. So today uh, we're going to start with the uh, the Umawi Khalifat. So uh, it's not the same Umawi Khalifat that we that was in um, in Damascus before. So this is a new uh, Khilafa that's beginning in uh, Europe in Muslim Spain. Uh, we're going to talk about a rebellion. So of course, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you a story. When I was in uh, grade uh, 10 history or grade 11 history, uh, we had a really old teacher. Like, I don't know, he was maybe 60, 70 years old. The guy had lived a lot of the Canadian history. He knew history very well. He was actually the history teacher at our school. And um, I, I hated history at that time. I actually didn't know anything about history. But I wanted to impress him, you know, make a good first impression. So, so I remember that like the first day in class, he asked about a question, what happened in this date? So I raised my hand and I said, it's a rebellion, right? I had no clue, it was just a, it was a guess, right? I, I said, history, it's either a war, it's a rebellion, you know, there's not many, much things that generally happen. And I was right, and from that, from that day on, uh, he thought I was like a genius in history, because he threw out a date and I threw out uh, a word, right? So the, you're gonna see this pattern, like history repeats itself, and um, if anyone asks you, history teacher asks you a question, what happened on this date? Uh, if you say war or rebellion, like 80% of the chance you'll be right, because <laughs> that's usually what uh, what happens. So we'll talk about the rebellion, inshallah. Um, so remember that there were three uh, Christian uh, kingdoms in the north, right? Remember we had the kingdom of Leon, uh, kingdom of Aragon, and the kingdom of Navarre, right? So we're going to talk about what happens to these kingdoms, inshallah. Uh, we're going to talk about a famous battle in history called the Battle of Samora. <coughs> Uh, and uh, it's a very special battle, we'll understand why. We're going to talk about uh, someone uh, very interesting called Al-Hakam ibn uh, Abdurrahman al-Nasr. So he was the son of, uh, as you can tell, Abdurrahman al-Nasr. So talk about um, what happened in his time and that was actually one of the very um, great times in, uh, in Muslim history. And I'll tell you something that this talk here, like you know every talk it's always like up and down, up and down, up and down. This talk is all up, alhamdulillah. So there's no downs, right? It's, uh, this is the golden age of Muslim Spain. So we're gonna hear a lot of good things inshallah today. And a lot of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, this is a time probably if you wanted to live in the Middle Ages, this is where you, you would want to have lived in, uh, in the golden age of Muslim Spain. And even there's, uh, there's events that happen during this time that, uh, that they celebrate now in modern Europe. Right, and it's it's widely acknowledged as the um, uh, the best time uh, and the best place in the Middle Ages. And then, you know, I always leave you with a cliffhanger to keep people coming back. It hasn't worked that well, I admit, but uh, we're still doing it, inshallah, and we're hoping it will <laughs> it will work. Um, 
Okay, so I just, wanted to, I just wanted to kind of sum up the periods that we've covered so far in the history of Muslim Spain. And you know, there's like, if you really want to benefit from this history, it's not very important to remember dates or even people, right? There's certain people you should remember because they were key people, but it's good kind of to get a general overview to kind of know the periods in the history, right? So every, like historians, when they, obviously when, they, when this history was happening, these periods weren't called by this name, right? It's only after when historians looked back and they kind of analyzed what happened uh, during each period in history that they kind of uh, came up with these names and that, that kind of allows people to study them, to classify them and to compare them with each other. So we talked about the, the Futuhat or the opening. That was uh, Musa ibn Nusayr, Tariq ibn Ziyad, right? We talked about the two phases uh, of governorship, right? Which remember during the, the phases of the governors, um, the uh, governor in, in, uh, in Cordoba was loyal to whom? First question. <laughs> so we're talking about the, the era of the governors, yes. That's right, Umayyad Khalifa, right? In, in Damascus, right? So he would, so basically the, at that time, um, the, uh, the, uh, the Andalus was just a, uh, a state, right? Or a province that was part of the Islamic Caliphate or the Umayyad Caliphate, right? And then we start in 138 with a new period in history which is known as the uh, Umayyad Emirate, right? And the reason it was called that, can anyone tell me why it was called an emirate as, as, a poor, as opposed to a governorship? Okay, so uh, it was called an emirate because uh, they broke off the ties with the Khalifa, right? So they became their own standalone, uh, you know, self-governing uh, state. And what, what was the reason that they broke off ties with the Umayyad uh, Caliphate at that time? Yes. <laughs> that, that's right. I mean, that's part of it, right? But it, it wasn't really Abdul Rahman al Dakhil. Um, uh, who, who, who broke away from the, um, from the caliphate? Was it Abdul Rahman al Dakhil? Yeah. And so there's two things that happened at the same time. You're right. The, 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 the overthrow of the Umayyad Caliphate, right? It was a very bloody overthrow. And uh, they killed a lot of the leaders of the Umayyads, right? And so Abdurrahman Idakhil escaped to Muslim Spain. And th that's part of it. But part of it as well was in the last of area of the governorships, you had someone called um, Abdurrahman al Fihri, where he actually declared secession from the um Umayyad Caliphate. So while the Umayyad Caliphate was still there, he declared that they were seceding, or they were, uh, you know, as Quebec, you know, claiming uh, independence. And then, uh, and then after that, Abdurrahman Idakhil. Uh, by that time he came to power, the uh, Abbasid Khal uh, Caliphate was in power and he couldn't establish any relationship with them because as the brother mentioned, they were trying to kill him. So we, we talk about, uh, there's a brief mistake, that should be second phase. So the, the emirate uh, has two phases, right? Um, the first phase was under um, Abdurrahman uh, al dakhil Abdurrahman the Enterer from 138 to 238 after Hijra. And then we, we talked about the second phase, which was just 16 years, inshallah. And, and then after that, we're, we're gonna start the Umayyad Caliphate. So what, what happened in 300 after Hijra? What was the, what was the event that happened there? Who, who came to power in 300 after Hijra? Yes, that's right. So the champion or the hero of our story, Abdurrahman, uh, the victorious, and why, why is his reign, or the beginning of his reign, broken down into two parts? Why is there an emirate part, and why is there a, a, a caliphate part? That's right, so what he did in, in the first uh, 16 years, he was uniting Al-Andalus, right? Because remember Abdurrahman and Nasser, he started out and he just uh, was the governor of Cordoba, right? Or, or Cordoba, right? And then, and then through his, uh, his, uh, his abilities and his, um, his work, he actually united all of Muslim Spain. So by 316 after Hijra, he had united the east and the west of Spain. And then he looked around and he looked at the world and he looked at the uh, Abbasid Khilafah. And what did he find with the Abbasid Khilafah? What did they control at that time? At 316 uh, after Hijra? Yes. 
That's right. They were, they were, they were doing very, very badly. Uh, and they're just controlling Baghdad, right? So even though they called themselves a Khilafah, they really didn't control much, right? It was just, it was just a picture of the Khilafah. But in reality, they just controlled Baghdad, right? And then who were, who were controlling Northern Africa at that time? That's right. The Shia were the, it was the, Fat, the, the Fatimid uh, Khilafah, and they were controlling Northern Africa, and they had declared that they were the Khilafah, right? So Abdul Rahman Nasser, he looks around and he says, I'm more deserving of that title, right? More deserving than the Abbasids, and I'm more deserving of the Fatimids, right? Because I was the one who united uh, Muslim Spain. So he basically called himself Amir al Mu'minin, and he declared that the Muslims in Spain would now be the new Umawi Caliphate. So the Umawi Caliphate had died uh, when the Abbasids had plotted uh, uh, to kill, right, uh, the leaders of the Umawis. And now the Umawis come back, but they don't come back in Damascus, right? They come back in Cordoba. Uh, in Muslim Spain under Abdurrahman al Nasser. So now in the world, we don't have one caliphate. We have three caliphates, right? Each of them claiming to be the Islamic, Islamic caliphate. Okay. So I wanted to now cover um, um, art and culture in Islam. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give uh, any fatwas today, unfortunately. So if you're looking for something to be halal or haram, I, I can't do that. Um, but I will, I will kind of give my, some reflections. And these reflections are not my reflections. They were made by uh, Dr. Raghib Sergani. He's a famous uh, Egyptian scholar and historian. And so we have to ask the question, right? Because remember, we blamed the problems that happened before the time of Jahman and Nasser, right? We blamed them on Ziryab, right? Ziryab was an entertainer, right? He came from Baghdad and he, he wanted to introduce people to arts and culture and music and dancing and so on. So people were going to ask, well, what's so bad about that, right? I mean, he, uh, you know, what's, what's wrong with that? So Allah says in the Quran, وَالشُعْرَاءُ which means, uh, as for the poets, they too are prone to deceive themselves, uh, and those who are lost in grievous error would follow them. So Allah Ta'ala, if you just look at this verse, it seemed to saying that, because poetry at that time represented art, right? If we go to um, sixth century common era uh, Arabia, the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the poets, what did they represent, right? At that time. Art, yes. But I mean, more than that, they represented the news, right? Like that's how the news was spread. Their history was spread through poetry, right? So it was more than art, it was their culture, right? The culture of the Arabs was captured in, in poetry at that time. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he's criticizing the poetry, it's really a symbol, if you will, for the, the arts and culture and the entertainment at that time, because that's what poetry was to the Arabs. But we should continue, right? Because um, when we take the Quran, it's not enough to take one verse out of context, we should take it within the context that it's used. So Allah SWT says, Alam tara annahum fi kulli wadin yahinun. Uh, talking about the poets, don't you see that they roam confusedly through all the valleys, right? And, and, the, and the, the meaning here is that, they're, that their poetry kind of takes people in different directions. It's, they're not really coherent, right? It confuses people. And they say what they don't do, right? And I always want to think, we, we kind of moved to the future, uh, you know, 1400 years. We're now in um, the 21st century, right? And what do we look at when you look at the singers and the actors and the entertainers? What, 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 really, what really strikes you about them? Yes. That's right, exactly. They, pro they project an image, right? If you, if, you, if you look at any actor or actress, any entertainer, right? And you see how they are in their performances and how they are in real life, you'll see it's really a facade, right? It's, they're projecting an image of success, of wealth, of, of influence, but these people underneath, right? They're very shallow and they don't really have, there's no core to them, there's no depth to them. So it's all about maintaining their image, right? And a lot of people are blindly led by this image to believe that this is success and these people are kind of the ultimate goals of the people we want to be. So Allah is, is warning us, right? 1400 years ago, 
that reality that these people may say beautiful words and they may seem very appealing, but reality underneath that, there is a bigger problem. And their, big, their biggest problem is unfortunately hypocrisy. And, they, and that they often say what they don't feel or what they don't do, right? So what's in their heart is not what they project. The image is not the real them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes, uh, and this is where Dr. Rukhtar Sirani says we should stop, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now making a general rule. General rule is arts and culture is haram, right? That these people are hypocrites and that they're misleading people. And then he makes an exception. Exception meaning that everything would be haram except for this istithna, except for this exception. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَانْتَصَرُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ ظُلْمِهِمْ فَسَيَعْلَمُوا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيِّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ Right? Which means that most people are like this, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, except the exception is save those who have attained faith, those who have iman, right? And those who do righteous deeds and remember God unceasingly. It means that they're constantly involved in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they defend themselves after they have been wronged. What does this mean? It means that they, um, and we're gonna get to the kind of the tafsir of this, um, but they're not people who give up. They're people of fortitude, they're people of principle, and they're willing to fight for their principles, right? So they're not just shells. They're not empty shells that they say, this is good and, and do this, and then they don't do it themselves. They actually put their you know, um, money where their mouth is, right? They put their, their efforts and their, um, they make jihad in what they believe in. So their, their outer self matches their inner self, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the evil doers will come to know how evil their, their destinies is, are, right? So for them, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, those people who are just like a shell, they may think they're fine and they're happy, everything's going good, but reality that the time is just uh, ticking and eventually their own evil will come back and overtake them. So I wanted to kind of um, reflect actually um, a little bit. And what Dr. Uh, Dr. Bas Sargani says, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here lists three conditions for us to, for arts and culture to be accepted in Islam, right? And the first condition is that it has to be based on iman and amal salih. It has to be based on faith, righteous actions. So it means it can't contradict the sharia, right? Because the sharia in Islam is two things. It's the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's a set of codes for life, right? So it can't contradict the sharia. And Allah says in the Quran, in Allah la yuslihu amalun mufsidin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not bring any benefit to the work of those people who are mischievous. Meaning that you can't be an, a bad person, like you can't be someone in your life who's, you know, his habit or her habit is doing bad deeds, and then be an entertainer and hope there'll be some good will come from entertainment, right? That entertainment, when it's given, it has to be done by good people, right? People who are in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who are following the sharia. I, uh, I meant to go back actually. Uh, is there a back button or I guess there isn't? Previous? Okay. Okay. Now, um, the second condition, right? What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا right? Means they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much, meaning that this entertainment should not be distracting from their remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that the, the, for these people, the main, the main focus of their life is remembrance of Allah and the entertainment is something that does not take away from that. Meaning, and, and, and we see this a lot, like people, they get addicted to music, and that's all they listen to is music, right? They're, it's, music doesn't become the exception for them, right? It's not something they do to relax, it becomes their life, it becomes the norm. And then they completely forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So that this entertainment should not take you away from the remembrance of Allah. And the third condition, and this is when he gets this one tasaru min mihim. The third condition is it must serve a useful purpose, right? It must serve some noble objective, uh, whether it's defending the Muslims or defending their image or their identity or their cause or promoting Islam. There has to be some noble intention behind it, right? Or serving some useful thing for humanity. It can't just be for no purpose, right? It can't be something that's idle. It has to serve um, some norm noble purpose. So. What the lesson we can learn from this, anytime we have some form of entertainment, we have to see, does it fulfill these conditions, right? And if it does, then inshallah, it's okay. If it doesn't, then we have to be careful because we're going against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's recommendations, instructions in the Quran.
So any questions about this section? No? Comments? Yeah. Yeah. That's right, exactly. So Allah SWT is saying, where are your priorities, right? In this verse, right? Meaning that if these qualities are in you as a person, that you have Iman and you do good deeds and you remember Allah much, then it's okay to have entertainment. It's good, it's okay to study poetry, it's okay, you know, other forms of entertainment, provided they don't, you know, contradict the Sharia in of themselves, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But if they become, as the sister mentioned, your focus, and that's the thing that you remember most, and that's where you spend your time, then that's where the danger is. And, and unfortunately, it's kind of a very slippery slope, right? Because, you know, um, everyone always says to themselves, well, you know, I'm just gonna do this a little bit and I'll go back and so on. And these things are addictive. So if you don't catch yourself, it's very easy to kind of slip into that. And it's difficult to go back afterwards. Jazakullah khair, that's a very um, uh, good observation. Okay, so I want to talk about the Umawi Caliphate now, okay? And it begins basically with power and strength. So, yes? Well, this is not my interpretation. It's the interpretation of Dr. Raghab Sirgani, a scholar. And the second thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he mentions uh, poetry in the Quran, right? He, what is poetry at that time? It was the culture of the Arabs, right? Like their, his, their oral history, their, their culture was all in poetry, right? It was kind of the the the, uh, the, henna, the music, the, uh, the books, the novels, everything was poetry for them at that time, right? Um, and... Um, like obviously I'm not, uh, I'm not a scholar to say these things are haram or halal, and that's what, not what I'm saying here, but I'm just saying if you get so involved in hinna that you don't uh, pray or you don't fast or you don't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you make that your focus, then that hinna becomes haram for you, right? right? It's not haram in of itself, but if, if this art becomes the, the thing that now is, the, is your goal in life, is your purpose in life, right? And this is what was happening, like the time of the Prophet wasallam. what are these poetries, what were they using their poetry for? Yes. Yeah. No, no, it's a symbol, right? Because poetry at that time was art. It was culture for them, right? It was, it was kind of their entertainment, right? So now in our, in our, in our, uh, we don't, not many people use poetry for entertainment. I mean, we have, we have YouTube, we have movies, we have TV shows, we have music, we have, uh, you know, parties, we have dancing. We have lots of things, right, that replaced poetry. But poetry is a symbol in the Quran, right? It's not meant just to say poetry, right? This is the point that Dr. Rahab Sargan is making, right? Is um, and so I'm not like uh, I'm not saying that you know having a wedding is haram or oh, it's a sunnah to have a wedding of course right or hanna is haram or anything. I'm just saying that don't make this a this is not your your purpose in life right. Your purpose of life is to worship Allah subhanahu wa taala, and uh, if you want to then integrate these things in a way that doesn't distract you from your purpose in life, then that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but don't uh, make that what you love and your focus right in life. Wallahu alam. This is I think the uh, what's intended. Is there any comments, uh, Brother Abdullah? No. Brother, Brother Haith, do you have any? Uh, you agree, disagree? I'm not a, by the way, I'm not a scholar or anything, so it's just uh, my opinion, right? Yes, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's right. And, the Islam didn't come to destroy culture, right, or to to uh, to take it away from people, but it, it it came to purify it and make it better and make it in the service of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, right? This was the idea, right? And uh, and you never see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling people to stop a, something unless it goes against the commandments of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But what he recommended is to people is that you need to first make the focus uh, being a good Muslim, right? And um, there was um, um, a Sahaba, his name was Abdullah ibn Rawaha, right? Uh, he's a famous uh, Sahaba. He died in the battle of, anyone know? Abdullah? 
No, okay. <laughs> no, I'll stop picking up on them. So there was, a, there was a battle when the Muslims went to fight the Romans, right? I believe it was the battle of, no, I forgot the name of the battle, but he was one of the mar people who were martyred um, in that battle, along with um, uh, Jafar ibn Ab Abi Talib and another Sahabi, I forgot his name, but uh, even before Islam, Abdullah ibn al-Waha was a poet. And he was really, um, he was renowned for, he loved poetry, right? And he would actually say poetry when the Muslims would go to war to encourage them, and he would say poetry for the Prophet Wasallam. So when he read this verse, he was really sad, right? Because he said like, you know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying that the poets are all bad people and they're all, you know, hypocrites and so on, right? This is the, the, the surface meaning. So he came to the Prophet Wasallam, and Allah revealed these ayahs, illa ladin amanu, meaning it doesn't apply to him, right? Because he was using his art in a good way. Right? His poetry was a, for a good end, for a good objective. So Allah Taala didn't mean the Sahabi Abdullah ibn Rawah radiallahu anhu. He meant the, the mushrikeen in Mecca who were using poetry to curse the Prophet, to, to try to spread evil rumors about him, to try to get... You know what they used to do? Is they actually went to Persia and they would, they would, they would go and learn the stories of the Persian kings, right? And the Persian folklore. And then they would come back to Mecca and the Prophet ﷺ would be telling the stories about the prophets, and they said, we have better stories, right? And so they would make their own, um, their own gatherings, and they would say, we'll tell you the stories of this king or this uh, folklore. And so they were using their art and the culture of the Persians to yasudduna an sabirillah, to turn people away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah alam, maybe this is part of what's being meant, right? This was Allah says in the Quran, نَحْنُ نَكُسُّ عَلَيْكَ أَحْسَنِ الْقَصَصِ right? We reveal to you the best of stories. Meaning, ignore these stories of the Persians and the folklore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you better stories. And why are those stories better? One, because they're true. Second, because they have lessons, right? They're beneficial in life, right? The, the story of Yusuf in itself is a beautiful story, but it also has a beautiful meaning behind it. And it has something, if we apply it in our life, we can become better persons. There are lots of stories that are very entertaining, but they're not beneficial at all, right? You just, in the end, you're, you're gonna regret that you wasted time on, on these stories, right? I'm not saying this applies to me, I, obviously I waste lots of time, but this is the principle, right? That we're trying to all, inshallah, benefit, benefit from. Does that make, uh, make sense? Yeah. I'm not meaning to go down hard on culture or anything. I'm not, I'm not against culture or anything. But the, the idea is that when the Muslims become enthralled and distracted and so into these things that they put them above Islam, they put them above Iman and, and Amal al-Salih and Dhikrullah, then it becomes the problem. Right? So, uh, so in 316 after Hijra, we talked that the Umawi uh, Caliphate was established. And it started off in strength, right? The strength was because Abd al-Rahman al-Nasr, as Brother Ahmed Khalil said, he had united the Muslims. He had united the Muslims in the east and the west, in the north and the south. And, um, and even it got to the point uh, where uh, he decided to go and fight the Fatimid Empire in northern Africa. So he sent, um, he sent armies, he conquered uh, Septa and Tanja. So basically he crossed actually the Strait of Gilbertrar. And the Septa and Tanja are actually in Northern Africa. So he conquered those ports. And the question is, why would he do that, right? And he did that because the Fatimid Empire were enemies, right, to him. So he wanted to protect himself. So by securing the Strait of Gilbertrar and the ports in Northern Africa, it made it difficult for them to attack him from the, from the north. But he didn't actually persist in fighting them. He just secured his, uh, his, uh, his sea, uh, seaboard front, and he went back. But he actually provided weapons to the resistance in North Africa. So there were people from Ahl Sunnah that were fighting against the Fatimids. So he provided them with, with weapons. But he didn't go himself. Okay. And then what happened after that um, is there was a rebellion, right? <laughs> and the question is, why do people rebel? Why, why, why is all the time we're seeing these rebellions? Yes. <laughs> That's right, right. Now, they had Abdul Rahman and Nasser as their leader. Why wouldn't they be happy? <laughs> so you're saying that these were bad people and he put rules that they didn't like. I guess, yeah, it's a, it's a possible explanation, yeah? Yes? Yeah, I mean, it is fitna, of course, but what, um, what do you mean by it's a fitna? <laughs> Oh, they're they're trying they're trying to bring down the uh, the uh, his government, right? Yes. So actually, in um, the the place that rebelled was called Saracosta, right? 
And um, the, they had their leader at that time was a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Hisham at tajibi right? And Saracosta was mainly inhabited by people called at tajibin so people from his tribe, basically. And he didn't just rebel against Abdul Rahman and Nasser, he actually went and joined the Kingdom of Leon. So he pledged allegiance to the Kingdom of Leon, and he went to fight Abdul Rahman and Nasser, right? Um, so let's see, what, what does Abdul Rahman and Nasser do? So Abdul Rahman and Nasser, he quickly gathered his army and he went to fight him. And, and, um, and very quickly, he, uh, he actually achieved victory over them and he captured their leaders. So he captured the leaders of the rebellion and he was about to execute them. When he, reserved, when he received word from um, the leader, Muhammad ibn Hisham al-Tajibi, that he was sorry for what he did and that he had made a mistake and that he wanted, you know, he wanted to, uh, to go back, right? He was, he, he was apologizing. And so what do you think Abdurrahman in Nasser does? Right? He's about to execute the leaders of the rebellion. And he's, the leader is saying, look, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Um, you know, I, didn't, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, what, what do you think he does? Sorry? Let's them go? Yes, he does actually. Good, mashallah. So he shows kindness and mercy. And this is one of the things about Abdurrahman and Nasser that we want to know, is that whenever, um, whenever he's in a position of weakness, He's brave and he's strong and he fights with, um, with courage. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him victory and he's, in, he's from a position of strength, that's the time to show um, kindness and mercy. So he actually lets them go. But uh, even more than that, and this was kind of incredible, is you know, you think, of, okay, let them go, but you know, at least execute the leader of the rebellion, Muhammad ibn Hisham al-Tajibi, right? Uh, or at least, you know, remove him from his position as leader of uh, Saracosta, right? He didn't actually, he, he forgave them and he put him back. He said, you can still be the leader of Saracosta. Um, and why do you think he did that? What was the, what was the, um, what was the wisdom in that? It's not a lesson, right? But in reality that now that they've seen this kind of very good treatment from Jahman and Nasr, do you think they're gonna rebel again? No, exactly. And do you think if he needs them later on to fight with him, they would fight with him? No, because he, they, they kind of feel now they owe him something, right? That he had a position to harm them and he didn't harm them, right? And the comparison we make with the seerah, the Prophet ﷺ after what the Meccans had done, right? They had abused and tortured him. They had caused him to have to leave Mecca, right? And then, you know, 10 years later he returns, right? And he has basically uh, an army of 10,000 strong and, you know, basically Mecca doesn't even fight, right? They surrender. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asks them, you know, the, um, the mushrikeen, what do you think I'm going to do with you, right? Uh, because if the opposite were true, what, what would they have done with him, with him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if they had conquered Medina? They would have killed him, right? And they were trying to kill him from the beginning, right? They, the reason he went to Medina, he was escaping their assassinate, assassination attempts. So they said, you know, a generous person, son of a generous person. And he said, go, you're, you're, go, you are free, right? And um, even Abu Sufyan, who was the kind of the leader of the Mushrikeen in Mecca, he basically said, whoever goes to the house of Abu Sufyan is safe, will not harm them, right? So he showed a lot of mercy, a lot of compassion. And, and as we mentioned before, what this resulted in is that these new Muslims in Mecca, because they accepted Islam at that time, they were very loyal to the Prophet Wasallam. So a couple of years later when the Prophet ﷺ died, and all of the Arabian Peninsula um, basically turned their back on Islam, they rebelled, only three cities stayed on Islam, right? One of them we'd expect, al Medina, but two you wouldn't expect, Ta'if and Mecca. Why do you think the Ta'if stayed on Islam? Yeah. Because uh, uh, after he returned, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So these are the two places the Prophet showed mercy to, right? Remember, he was offered to destroy a Ta'if, right? He said, no, I make dua for them instead, that Allah will will bring Islam from their children. And he could have destroyed Mecca, right? The Prophet ﷺ had the power, he, was, he had an army. He could have, he could have destroyed the mushrikeen in Mecca, but he, he gave them mercy. And because of that, it moved something in their hearts that even when they had the chance to rebel, right? Once the Prophet ﷺ died, everyone is rebelling, right? They, they're, they're no longer being bound, right? They have no, there's no consequence now to their rebellion, right? In fact, had they rebelled, and that probably would have been the end of Islam, right? Because, um, you know, the, the Medina would just have been left as, as Muslim. And even the Medina at that time was going through a time of weakness. They were being attacked by the Persians and the Romans. There were lots of other challenges. So it was mercy from Allah, of course, but again, the wisdom of, the, of how to deal with, uh, with people.
Mm -hmm. So now we want to, what does Abdurrahman and Nasser do now? So he basically, he's, uh, he's fixed the rebellion problem in Saracosta. What, who, who is he going to fight next? Who's the enemy? Who's the real enemy that he sees? Sorry? That's right, the three kingdoms actually. So there's three, there's three Christian kingdoms in the north. There was Aragon, um, Leon, and Navarre, right? Aragon, Leon, and Navarre. Now, did these kingdoms always exist? No. When did they come into existence? And why? Like they didn't, at the time of uh, Musa ibn al and his yet, they didn't exist, right? They came later during the period of weakness, right? When the Muslims became weak and started fighting among themselves, they were able to, t to conquer. The Christians came from Europe. They were able to conquer these lands and basically set up these kingdoms, right? So they were not the original kingdoms. These were new kingdoms that had been uh, created to take advantage of the weakness of the Muslims. And their whole existence was basically to threaten, as the sister mentioned, the Muslims from the north. So what does he go? He goes off to Aragon. And Aragon basically is the kingdom that's bordering uh, Saracosta. Um, and alhamdulillah, he fights them. He has victory for the, for, for the Muslims. He then conquers Barcelona, right? So most people know Barcelona for the soccer team, right? That's there. But Barcelona was actually a very important city uh, even at that time. And it was actually, it was conquered originally by uh, Musa ibn Nusayr, right? And then later on, it was taken back by uh, the Christians, and then it was conquered again uh, by Abdurrahman al Nasr. And during that time, uh, it was a period of strength. The Muslim army reached 100,000 fighters, which at that time was a, was a very, uh, very big number, right? So that's actually bigger than Canada's army now, right? We don't have 100,000 fighters. Like, there's a joke, there's more uh, subs in the uh, West Edmonton Mall than there is in the Canadian Navy. Yes? Uh, Yeah, Saracosta is in the north. I actually have a map. Um, let's see if I can get to it. Uh -huh. No, that was the wrong one. Okay, okay so if I go, uh, go to slide, so I was on eight. Oops. So, okay, so this is the map of so alhamdulillah, I finally got an excuse to use the laser pointer. Is it working? Can you see it? Okay, great. Okay, so this is the, this is the kingdom of Leon here, the kingdom of Aragon, and this is Saracosta here. So it's in, it's in the northeast, right? So you notice that um, this is uh, Tulaytila here, this is uh, Cordoba here. So it's the capital. This is where Abdul Rahman al-Nasr is, right? And this is the place that rebelled, right? The problem, and this is, um, and Barcelona actually is here. So you remember when we talked about the original openings that uh, the Tark ibn Ziyad had reached actually right up to the Pyrenees, right? In, in France, right? And actually conquered Barcelona and all these areas. But afterwards, during the period of weakness, they actually, the Christians reconquered them and they set up kingdoms in the north. So they set up uh, kingdoms in Aragorn, in Leon, right? And, and Navarre, I believe, is here. Um, and what happens, well, we're going to see what's going to happen, but Abdurrahman uh, and Nasser, now he heads north and he actually defeats the kingdom of Aragon, right? And um, basically they agree now to pay the jizya to Abdurrahman and Nasser. So, it'd be, you know what would be cool? If we had like two of them and one of them I could show the map and one I could show the slides. That would be... I kind of suggested to the organizers to make like a huge poster with the map and we could like bring it every time. But... Okay, I'm here now. Okay. Um. Okay, so let me see how I'm gonna start again. Okay. Okay, so I think we're on slide eight, right? Okay, so so that he, he defeats the, uh, the kingdom of Aragon. He liberates Barcelona. And um, we reach 100,000 fighters. So what does he do next? 
Okay? And this is something that, that repeats itself in, in Muslim history. <coughs> is the problem with, what's the problem with success? <laughs> exactly. You want to do more, but success tends to get to people's heads, right? Like the more they're successful, the more they, they win and they have victories, the more they feel that they're invulnerable, right? They can't be defeated. And nobody's immune to it from this, right? Like uh, even in the seerah, you find lots of interests, instances where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, for example, in the Battle of Hunayn, Allah says, وَيَوْمَ حُنَيْنٍ إِذْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ كَثْرَتُكُمْ and on the day of Hunayn, Hunayn is one of the famous battles in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, when your numbers impressed you. It means you were impressed by the numbers, right? And it, didn't, it doesn't benefit you anything in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So the Muslims, unfortunately, when they reached 100,000, they became impressed with themselves, right? And they depended, instead of depending on Allah, like at the beginning when Abdurrahman and Nasr was weak, he had no choice. He had to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Because in the beginning, he controlled only one-tenth of the land of Al-Andalus, right? He only controlled Cordova. But when he got very strong, he made a mistake. And instead of depending on Allah, he started to depend on the numbers, right? And so we have the famous battle of Samura. And the Muslims went into this battle saying, we can't be defeated, right? We're now the superpower in the earth. We have 100,000. There's probably no army on earth now that can match us. So we're just going to walk all over everyone. You know, it's, uh, it's easy going from here. So they went, they now, they said Aragon fell. It was very easy. Why not Leon, right? Why not the kingdom of Leon? So they take the army of 100,000. They head to Leon. They depended on their numbers, right? And unfortunately, because of their depending on their numbers, on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were defeated. And, uh, and not only were they defeated, but half of the Muslims were killed or captured during the battle of Samora. Right, so he went in with an army of 100,000, he came out with an army of 50,000. Right, so half the Muslim army uh, was either captured or killed in the uh, Battle of Samora. So it's obviously one of the sad battles in, in the story. But what the positive what that came out of the Battle of Samora, and this is, shows the character of Abdurrahman and Nasser, is that even though it was a very bitter defeat and it was very obviously depressing, um, he realized right away his mistake. He realized that the reason that they were defeated was because of their, the army's reliance on their numbers, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he went back to Qurtoba and he, he and the scholars, they tried to re-educate people about Islam. So they taught them these lessons. They said, you know, the, we made this mistake and they taught them about the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu And they said, you know, we now, the, the solution is we're gonna turn back in Tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're gonna go back to our founding principles, which is to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's exactly what um, they did, right? So um, the Muslims afterwards, they, uh, after they went back to uh, Cordoba, they kind of regrouped, they, uh, they made repentance, they turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and in 329 after Hijrah, they went back again to Leon, right? And this time, they're not depending on their numbers anymore. They're depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and they're victorious. And not only one victory, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them victory after victory after victory. And all of the Christians' kingdoms in northern Spain fell. So Leon fell and Navarre fell and Aragon had fell previously. So now there is no, all the Christian kingdoms in northern Spain are now paying jizya to Abdurrahman and Nasr. So it's a complete victory. He's now reconquered almost all of the lands that were conquered originally by uh, Musa ibn Nusayr and Tariq ibn Ziyad. So the question we have to ask ourselves, <coughs> is this all Abdurrahman and Nasser did? Or does he have other accomplishments? Right? Uh, is it just military and political victories? Or did he accomplish other things as well? Um, yes, on the religion side, but also in terms of civil society, like institutions and, and, uh, and, 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 and building civilization, right? Yes, Salma. That's right, very good. So the, 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 mashallah, the palace of Zahra. And the palace of Zahra is actually at the center of a city, which is what, what the city called. <laughs> the, city, the city of Zahra as well, right? So the palace of Zahra in the, in the city of Zahra. So now, you know, this is actually the biggest slide I ever wrote. But you don't see it because I actually put it all in the uh, 
in the notes, right? And it's all the accomplishments of Abdurrahman al-Nasir. And it just really, when people hear these accomplishments, they really don't believe them. Because remember that Abdurrahman al-Nasir, he only ruled for how many years? For 50 years, right? From 300 to 350 after Hijra. And the first 16 of those years were what? Were basically uniting Al-Andalus, right? So he really, um, and most of the time was spent in jihad. But despite all that, he has incredible accomplishments. And he, he made, uh, you could argue, the, he built the foundation of the greatest civilization of the Middle Ages, by far. And this is even acknowledged by Western historians, that the Muslim Spain at the time of Abdurrahman al Nasser, the time of his son, became the jewel of the world, one of the wonders of the world, and the, the pinnacle of civilization at that time, during, during the history. And, and one thing was very interesting about him is he was balanced on all aspects. Yes, he, he gave very um, strong importance to the military and strength and developing the military, but he didn't neglect the other aspects of life. He developed um, a ministry of public works, right? With many different uh, public servants, a minister, right? And, and these were tasked with building up planning and building up the actual uh, civil society. So this is one of the examples of the first civil service, right? In, in, uh, in Canada, we have right uh, civil service, right? We have government, there's ministries, and then there's deputy ministries, and then there's managers, and then there's employees. And these people run the uh, organization of the state. So at his time, he, he, he basically developed something similar to that. He built the city of Zahra. And this city in Zahra was um, to the northeast, and it became the jewel of the world at that time. And many delegations would come from all over the world to show their love and respect for Abdurrahman al Nasser and for the, the civilization he had built, right? He actually built it from building materials that were brought from Europe, from Turkey, from Baghdad, basically. He brought the best building materials from all over the world to build the city of Zahra. And in, never in Islam was a castle seen like the castle of Zahra. And it became a, a wonder of the world at its time. So it was very, very beautiful. And you know, like people, where do people go today when they want to see something beautiful? Paris. They go to Paris, right? Or they go to the French Riviera, or they go to Spain, right? <laughs> um, but at that time, the place to go was uh, Al Andalus, right? So if you had a, if you had lots of money and you had uh, you want to go on a honeymoon, you would go to Al Andalus, right? That was the the city at the uh, at that time. And um, and the population of uh, of Cordoba grow. Does yeah, anyone know what the population of uh, Cordoba reached, or Cordoba? Any guesses? Omar, you have a guess? No? I'll, I'll let you know, it, it became... 500, yes, mashallah, very good. It became the second largest uh, city at that time in the world. So what was the largest city in the world at that time? <laughs> It was New York at that time, right? No, it wasn't that kind. No. Baghdad, that's right. The largest city in the world was Baghdad. And how many, what's the population of Baghdad at that time? Sorry? No. No. <laughs> Two million. Two million people. <laughs> so this is Brother Abdullah, who was uh, originally supposed to be doing the series. So uh, I will just uh, I leave it uh, I leave it for him. <laughs> so unfortunately, I have to I, I, I have to stop making things up now since he arrived. So uh, <laughs> the story's going to get a lot more boring now that I can't uh, add my uh, <laughs> my flavor to it. We had, we had a debate about art and culture in Islam, so we had some uh, some strong opinions. <laughs> so we, um, so uh, that's right. So Baghdad at that time was uh, was two million people. Um, Subhanallah, Abdurrahman Nasser he created how many how many um, how many mansions do you think were in was in Cordoba at that time during the time of Abdurrahman Nasser? Like how many mansions are in Ottawa? A few thousand, maybe. Right? There was 13,000 in, in, in Kutub at that time. To give you the sense of the, and these mansions had huge houses and gardens, and you know, it was a beautiful, a beautiful place. How many mosques do you think they had in Kutub? Just a guess, number at the time. Sorry? 
How many mosques in Ottawa? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, you're close though. You're you're in the right order of magnitude. <laughs> three thousand mosques. He built three thousand mosques. Mashallah. And he expanded uh, the Masjid of Cordoba, and it became one of the wonders of the world at its time. The, the Masjid of Cordoba because of its beauty, and the Mihrab, right? Uh, the Mihrab is the um, uh, the area where the where the Imam is, right? The beginning of the front of the Masjid. It was actually one piece of marble imported from Italy. So he actually brought a huge piece of marble from Italy and they built the, uh, the mihrab with it. Uh, he created uh, zoos all over, all over uh, Andalus. They set up zoos and, and bird sanctuaries, right? SubhanAllah. And uh, you know how, much, how many ships did their navy have at that time? I don't know, 200 ships, but 200 was an incredible number at that time. I think the Canadian Navy has 10 ships or 15, I'm not sure. I know they have like one submarine, I'm not sure if it's working or not, but um, the, army, the army reached, um, you know, after, obviously after the Battle of Samora, um, they, they regrouped and they rebuilt, reached 100,000 knights, which was a huge army at that time. He also built uh, many, many weapons factories, right? So in many of the cities, he would build weapons factories. So he's building the infrastructure of the country, right? He was creating, in essence, a superpower that would be self-sustaining. And he gave great importance to agriculture. So he'd import plants and seeds from all over the world. He would plant huge gardens. He created uh, big industries based on cotton and wheat, right? So staples, right? Cotton, wheat, and rice. And so this, what, what is, what is it? his plan was to make Al-Andalus self-sufficient, right? They could grow their own food. They could produce their own weapons, right? They had their own libraries. Meaning that even if the rest of the world cut them off, they could still grow and prosper, right? They weren't dependent uh, on other people. He also did something which was very uh, interesting, and this was new. He would create uh, markets, specialized markets, right? So there would be a market for meats, there would be a market for plants, there would be markets for metals, right? So um, this kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, like, you, you, you know, certain malls specialize in clothes, certain malls for cars, you know? So, like even in today's society, they, this idea in business that you kind of group things together, right? Like in Saudi Arabia, there's a gold market where you find all the gold vendors. There is a market for silk, for example, right? And, and, the, and, the, and the wisdom behind that is, is you get the best people from all over the world, they wanna be part of this market. So you encourage trade and, and, and business, right? And what did the, the treasury reach? So what was the annual income of, uh, of Al Andalus at that time, during the time of Abd al-Rahman al-Nas? <laughs> and of course, it, it's of course you have to remember that the, that that at uh, that time a dollar was a dollar, right? Like right now a dollar can't even get you a coke at the uh, the coke machine. So uh, um, so money had obviously a value, and the treasury reached six million uh, golden dinars, right? So um, and 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 uh, of course we'll uh, we'll now we'll, uh, we'll we'll have the quiz right for the prizes, uh, but brother Abdullah can't answer of course he's uh, be too easy inshallah. So h- how did uh, Abdul Rahman and Nasser divide the treasury? Like what did, how did the, the budget of his country? Yes. Yeah. No. Okay, well, I think Omar was right. Omar was next, right? He, he put his hand up first. Yeah. One third for the people, like the society. Okay. One third for trade. Yes, excellent, right? Excellent. So, mashallah. We, does anyone remember what the U.S. Uh, deficit, the, sorry, the U.S. debt is in 2010? 14.5 trillion, right? So I, I, did a, I did a little bit of math, right? You take 14.5 trillion and you divide it by 300 million. How much does each American owe in debt? Anyone good in math? I did it myself, I could be wrong though, because the, the numbers wouldn't fit on the calculator that well, but it was close to um, $45,000 American. So imagine every American own, uh, owes, like even a baby when they're born, they're $45,000 in debt, right? right? So if the Chinese and the Russians, everyone started calling their debts, people would be selling their clothes and their house and their cars, because they're you know $45,000 in debt. And so subhanAllah, and this is so the wisdom, right? That it was not, they didn't spend money they didn't have, and they would always save, right, for a, for a rainy day.
Okay, so it became the, the city of Zahra became the jewel of the world. And, um, and by far, and this is admitted even by Western historians, that at the time of Abu Ahmad al-Nasr, it was the most powerful nation on earth, right? Like none of the Christian nations or Christian kingdoms, or even the Muslim um, um, caliphates like the Fatimids or the Abbasids at that time uh, could compare to the, uh, to the strength of Al-Andalus. And um, so now we're gonna go to the next part. So what happens to Abd al-Rahman al-Nasr? In the year 300, 350 after Hijra, he, he dies, right? Allah And then he chooses before he dies, his son, uh, Al-Hakam ibn Abd al-Rahman al-Nasr to succeed him. And this, the time of Al-Hakam, um, is actually um, considered to be the high point in Al-Andalus history, right? So this was the, the highest point in terms of strength, in terms of the economy, in terms of culture, in terms of knowledge. And then after that, once you reach the high, where is it going after that? It's going down, right? It doesn't, it doesn't go all the way down. There's gonna be some things that happen, of course. But this was the high point of, uh, of Islamic civilization in Muslim Spain. And, and really the reason for that is because his father, he set the base, right? He set up the principles, he set up the economy, he set up the system of government that, um, and his son was like his father, right? Um, it, it, it carried them through. So like father, like son. So he was raised by him, he was very similar to him, and he was, um, he had his unique personality, but he, his, his method of governance was very close to that of his father. Um, where maybe he differed, is that he was a big intellectual, like Abd uh, ibn al-Hakam and uh, ibn Abdurrahman. So Abd al-Rahman al-Hakam ibn Abd al-Rahman al-Nasr was known as a scholar scholar. I mean, he really valued the scholars, and he himself was a scholar, and he loved knowledge, right? And so he really focused on building up the the knowledge and the learning uh, in in uh, in Cordoba, and he actually created a new library, which he called the Umawi Library. And um, basically this library at that time, it rivaled the two other uh, biggest libraries in the world, which were where? So what were the other two biggest libraries in the world? Yeah. No. Baghdad is one of them, right? No, we talked about it if, like 20 minutes ago, the other bigger one. It was built by Abd al-Rahman al-Nasr. In Cordoba, right? The library of Cordoba, right? So he built a new one. So now they have two of the biggest libraries in the world are in uh, uh, in, uh, in Al-Andalus, the Umawi Library and the Library of uh, Cordoba. And he actually created new jobs for people, right? So there were people um, whose jobs, they just traveled the world gathering books for the library. So they go city to city, anytime they find a place that had good books, they would transcribe them and they would bring them back to be placed in the Umawi Library. So he collected the knowledge of the entire world in that sense, like all the biggest philosophers and, and scholars of the world, he would collect their books and bring them back. And if the books were not in Arabic, he would have them translated uh, to Arabic. And um, there's a new uh, profession that came out called an nasakhun And these are people who would, actually their job was just to transcribe books. They didn't have photocopiers or printing presses. So if you wanted to read a book, you'd go to the, li you'd go to the library, you'd say, I like this book. The guy would copy it for you and give you your own copy to, to read, right? And he started a paper making factory. So with all those books and all people transcribing books, these huge factories um, that made paper. And the paper that they made was so good that the bishops uh, and the high priests of Europe would actually buy their paper to write the gospels on it. Because they didn't have their own paper, so they would buy their, because that was the best quality paper was made in Al-Andalus. So they became an, um, an export based economy. They exported lots of things to the, um, to the world around them. Probably his biggest accomplishment, um, and this actually speaks to his focus on knowledge, is he eliminated illiteracy, right? So among, there was nobody in Al-Andalus at that time who was illiterate, right? And this is something even in today's day, there's very few countries that have 0% illiteracy, right? Even countries such as the US and European countries, there's some illiterate people, right? Uh, and if you look at African and Asian countries, the percentage is much higher. Uh, but SubhanAllah, and the way he did this is that he would get, he gave everyone a right to education. So if you were poor, you would get a scholarship to study, right? And if you're rich, you could pay for it. But he created a system like we have now, like a public education system, where everybody um, could learn. He started uh, the University of Cordoba, right? And the, this was, university was different from other universities of the time in the sense that it had 
uh, full-time staff, professional professors, right? Usually at that time, like say you went to learn from a scholar, that scholar would also have another job. Like he might be a farmer or he might be a merchant, right? Because you couldn't really be afford to be a scholar and just a scholar, you wouldn't get any money. But he created full-time like professorships in universities where you could just be a professor and that's it. You wouldn't have to do any other job. So created, you know, very similar to the university system that we, we have today. And you could also be a full-time student, right? So before that time, if you wanted to learn, you kind of have to work and learn at the same time. But now you could actually attend university as a full-time student and the state would, uh, would support you through scholarships. So what happened, it's interesting, is that the, uh, the kingdom Christians in the north, you know, they had paid the jizya to Abdurrahman and Nasser, but they obviously were not very happy about it, right? They're just waiting for their chance to you know, get their revenge. So when they saw that uh, Al-Hakam was, uh, was focusing on knowledge and libraries and books and scholars, they said, maybe he doesn't know anything about jihad. He's not really a warrior, he's a scholar, right? So we'll go attack him and see what we can do. Of course, it was a bad, bad decision because he wasn't just a scholar, right? And he fought, he was a great warrior like his father. And uh, so they perceived that weakness, and, but they were very, very wrong. In fact, he was, he was like his father in terms of jihad. He fought very, very hard and he defeated them um, like his father. And because he defeated them, he earned their respect, they feared him, and they paid jizya to him again. So things just went back to the way before. They, they had to try. I guess it was a good try, but in the end, uh, as they had paid to his father, they paid the jizya to him as well. And he did something his father didn't do. He actually defeated the Fatimids and he conquered Northern Africa. So remember that the, the Fatimid Empire had controlled Northern Africa. So he fought against the Fatimid. And now, so now at the time of Al-Hakam, Al-Andalus is not just Muslim Spain. Al-Andalus is all of Northern Africa as well, right? So he conquers Northern Africa. And unfortunately, so, so at this point in time, uh, after he conquers Northern Africa, this is called the highest point. So if you look at history and you kind of plot it like a graph, this is the pinnacle of, Islamic, of, of the history of Al-Andalus. It was peak in terms of civilization, in terms of strength, in terms of culture, in terms of kind of any measure that you measure a civilization or a nation by, Al-Andalus had reached uh, its peak. Unfortunately, after that, um, he became paralyzed during the last part of his life. And when he became paralyzed, he chose his son. His son, his name was Hisham um, ibn al-Hakam, right? Hisham ibn al-Hakam. There was a problem though. And that problem is, can someone tell me what the problem with Hisham was? Yes. That's right, he's young, right? How, how young is he? He's 12, very good, mashallah, he's 12, right? So he was 12 years old. Now, everyone makes mistakes, and this was one of the mistakes of Al-Hakam. Um, is that he chose his son. And the problem, what, what's the problem with you, you choosing someone to be 12 to be the leader of the strongest nation on earth, right? Like it's almost as bad as choosing George Bush, right? Like it's not, it's a joke. So it, it's, um, it has no ability to do anything, right? Even if he's good, even if he's uh, smart, even, you know, at 12 years old, how can you lead the strongest nation on earth? And you can't, right? So what, what ended up happening is that they actually, um, um, had to appoint an advisory committee. So they chose three people <coughs> um, that would act as his advisory committee, right? So they had a system of government that was basically this guy, Hisham, in the, in the picture. He's the Khalifa, and three people are controlling him in the background, right? Is this system of government gonna work? <laughs> it's a pu puppet regime, right? The puppet, uh, you know, you have a face of a leader and then behind it you have people with different Interests, maybe even opposing interests, right? So we're gonna see what happens to young Hisham. We're gonna see what happens to the advisory committee. You know, does it work out? Um, we're gonna see what happens in North Africa, right? Because obviously the, the uh, Andalus now includes North Africa. So we, uh, we're expanding our history course to uh, North Africa as well. And, uh, and what happens to the Muslims in Spain? So. That's it, alhamdulillah. So I just want to give you, show you some pictures of uh, Al-Zahra, um, a city and palace in... Uh, Overlay, oh, okay, sure. Uh, Al-Zahra as well. 
Yes. Yep. Okay, let me... Uh, We need the technical support. There we go. Okay, so very romantic atmosphere. So here is um, Al, Al Zahra. Uh, so some of the arches, and you can see the beauty, Subhanallah. And the, you know, obviously at that time they didn't have the uh, the tools we have today. So it's just incredible that they could. Uh, sorry, that they could build. I'll just stay like this. Um, I think it's when I talk that it does that. Oh, it's where I went. Okay. <laughs> so this is one of the, the pictures here. Again, there's another picture. So you can see the gardens and, and the water that they had, right? And uh, and this is this is a map of Al Andalus. So um, that's all I have for uh, for today. So before we end, um, does anyone have any questions? Any comments, uh, complaints? Yes, brother. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't mention it, um, and I'll give you the reason. Because I, uh, I didn't understand the Arabic if it was vacation or something else, so I don't want to embarrass myself. But now that I know it's vacation, I'll, uh, I'll tell the story, inshallah. Or would you like to tell the story? So basically, um, uh, when he, after he died, he was to keep a journal, right? And then every time he would take a day of vacation, he would mark it in his journal. And so they counted the total number of days of vacation. And what do you think it was when he died? Yeah, he ruled for 50 years. <laughs> it's close, you're close, yeah. 40 days, that's right. Jazakullah. It was 14, okay. Again, my Arab, that's an Arabic issue, but uh, I heard it as 40. So it's 14 days, mashallah. So 14 days, like I know at work, like we get 20 days a year. And we complain, right? Because in the government, I think they get more, and in Europe, they get more. So subhanAllah, imagine 14 days over 50 years. And even then, he was kind of... Uh, you know, that this was, it was kind of as if he was regretting that these days were wasted days, that he could have, you know, he could have done more. <coughs> Inshallah, Brother Abdullah, do you have any other? Uh... Yeah. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Subhanallah. So every every three years he would take a day off. Every three years. Um, like uh, we take actually we take a day off every five days, right? You know, they said unless you have a long weekend, then you it's every four. So alhamdulillah, like you can see these people where their uh, motivation was and where their uh, ambition was, you know. Inshallah, maybe Allah SWT will give this um, more people. That, uh, so any more questions, comments? So I finished on time today, which is my biggest uh, accomplishment uh, so far. Uh, so uh, so uh, is there a closing? Someone will do the closing? Oh, the closing? Okay. We'll make, uh, we'll make closing duas, and inshallah there is, uh, there is pizza. And uh, leave sister, who has a free pizza? Brother Omar, right? You got a free pizza? or? Who answered my question? That one I asked? There was a sister, right? Or wasn't there? Yeah, I think it was uh, Ithar, yeah. Okay, so Ithar, you have a free slice of pizza? <laughs> you guys are dressed the same and you look the same. So, Ithar, uh, a free, uh, free slice of pizza, inshallah. And. Uh, uh,